Welcome back to You're Wrong, I'm Right, hosted by me, Cameron, with Bodie and Robbie. This episode we are going to be discussing um, Days of Future Past, because I think, Robbie, you said it's now six years since that movie came it's out? It's been about six years correct? since release of X-Men Around Days of Future years. Past. Yeah. Um, the episode won't be out at the six-year mark, but we are recording it at the six-year mark. So, Yeah. Um, also, we, who, about going? F- four years since Apocalypse came out, and oof. not exactly a whole year since Dark Phoenix came out, but around there. Oof. X, uh, Fox officially has no rights to X-Men. That's not anymore. Hallelujah. Goodbye, Brian Singer. Mm, pretty much. I mean, he was gone with Dark Phoenix, but... I know, but like, it's like, no, like, for good. Yeah. Well, technically, right. Brian Singer's career has gone for good. Well, yeah, but like, yeah, I think he might have come he's back gone. somehow. Yeah, I doubt it. Once you diddle some kids, it's kind of hard. Yeah, to come but back that, from that. that stuff was going on for like twenty plus years. Yeah, which only makes it worse. <laughs> anyway, um, who's going first this time? I was gonna go first this time. All right, Robbie, sweep us off our feet. Take it away. I am really excited to talk about X-Men Days of Future Past. I remember when the first trailer came out uh, back in, I think it was 2013, and I was so excited for this movie. Like, um, when, when I was growing up, I had two superhero franchises that I would watch constantly, which was the Spider-Man trilogy and the X-Men films. While I think Raimi's Spider-Man movies have held up a lot better than the, uh, the Fox X-Men movies have, I still do have a great appreciation for those films, despite how cheesy they are. They still have their own very distinct voice, like X-Men 1, X-Men 2, X-Men 3, which is not good, uh, X-Men mm-hmm. Origins, which sucks. So, you know, mm-hmm. they started off good, there was like a real decline in quality, X-Men First Class comes out, and holy shit, this franchise is back on its feet. It's really good. And then they announced the big, the next big project was going to be X Men: Days of Future Past, which Brian Singh was coming back to direct the project after leaving from X Two. They are bringing the old cast from the OG films and the new cast from the um, rebooted franchise. And rewatching this movie, I always forget how much I love watching X Men: Days of Future Past. There was so much. There was so much stuff I, I love about this film, and I won't go on too long, but every time I watch this movie, I find myself liking it more and more, and finding new stuff to appreciate, whether it's the acting, and the character development, the action scenes, the story itself, the way everything is structured. Like, this is, I'm not saying this is the best overall made X-Men movie, but Days of Future Past is absolutely my favorite X-Men movie. Alright, uh, am I next or are you, buddy? I think you're next. Alright. Um, well, I am very, my opinion is very similar to Robbie's there. Um, I think it's just, I think, personally, I do think it's the best uh, X-Men movie. I think, obviously, First Class is, like, right there against it. Like, it's, it's very much a big contender, but I personally find myself enjoying um, Days of Future Past a little bit more. I don't know, I always, I, I kind of really like time travel, and I kind of like how they had their spin on it, where um, nothing comes in, like, nothing he does comes into effect in the um, present world uh, until he wakes up, so everything he does won't alter anything, and then once he wakes up, then it all gets changed, so they kind of coexist in the same way, so it's like, it is kind of like a race against the clock, while also going back in time, I thought it was kind of an interesting... Oh, excuse me, an interesting take on it. Um, and the acting in it is just incredible. James McAvoy oh. playing uh, uh, a basically heroin-addicted 60s just person who's lost it all. Like, he just does such a great job of playing that character, and you really feel his emotion. You really He just drives it home, and it's so, so, so good. 
Um, and I just, I don't know. There's never a point in that movie where I'm just like, all right, let's get a move on. Like, it's just, it's just genuinely a fun movie to watch. It keeps you interested at all times. And obviously it has the best Quicksilver, um, sequence that has ever been done. So, yeah. All right. Um, so we kind of got into a theme with these episodes where the first person, uh, has the most positive things to say and the last person has the least positive things to say. Um, I won't, I won't go out and say that, uh, Days of Futures Past is a really bad film because I think there's a lot of really, really good things in this film. Um, I think the opening, like the whole setup and the opening of the film, I felt was really, really strong. Um, setting up to the future events that occur within um, the future, followed by, you know, their their task to kind of go into, you know, the the past to sort of, you know, the whole the whole setup for the time travel thing I think works really well, and makes a lot of sense to me. I think it's one of the best films, one of the best modern films at least, to sort of handle the idea of time travel. Um, because if I remember correctly, most time travel films, you like send your physical self back in the past and it just becomes this very wishy-washy thing, like basically a back to the future premise. Um, but I really like the approach of them going, um, taking Wolverine's conscious into the, into the past and having him play out that, those events and the way he does it is like very like to the point and blunt. He's just like, you know, I'm I'm from the future. This is what happens. And the robots don't really come from him. They really come from all the other characters that appear in it who are vastly different people from the the, you know, from the future timeline. Um I don't know. I think every time I watch it it sort of it sort of clicks less for me and i'm not entirely sure why um cuz there's a lot of really good things in this film um the acting is top notch as always um quicksilver is a gem his sequences are some of the best in this entire film um james mcavoy's fantastic um Everybody's fantastic. Hugh Jackman, Michael Fassbender, um, Jennifer Lawrence, I thought was solid. Um, I don't know. I think, I think what really, I think what really bothers me the most is that I think stylistically it's the weakest or one of the weaker films that Brian Singer has directed in comparison to say the first two X-Men films. I find this one just does not have a lot of interesting things to look at or on an editing purposes kind of sloppy um, with the exception of the Quicksilver fight or the, the Quicksilver sequence. Um, that is wholly a fantastic segment um, through and throughout. Um, I have like literally no complaints about that. Evan Peters really freaking kills it as... Um, as Quicksilver. I think really it's just the writing is just not a hundred percent there for me. Um, considering the fact that the script was written by Simon Kimberg, who has a hit or miss relationship with screenwriting. Um, most of the scripts that he has written um are always kind of dependent on how well the director interprets his scripts. Um, I guess you could say the best script that he's ever written has been Sherlock Holmes, the first one. But even then, it was him and two other people. And I think one of those screenwriters included Guy Ritchie, who directed the first Sherlock Holmes film with Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law. But that said, here it's also, it's like, there's things in it that I don't really enjoy. I wish the past, um, I wish the, or sorry, I wish the present x-men had a little bit more to do they kind of disappear for almost like an hour until in the past when wolverine and 
uh, Beast and Xavier go off into Paris to try to stop Mystique from killing Bolivar Trask. And then Wolverine starts having these PTSD moments when he sees uh, the younger Colonel Stryker, which I really, really liked how Colonel Stryker was in this film as a younger version. I thought whoever played him, Josh... Uh, not Holloway, just something. Um, I thought he did a really fantastic job at kind of portraying a younger, sort of smuggish. He kind of he kind of conveyed the the smugness that Brian Cox had in X two, um, which I really enjoyed and appreciated. Um, I think I think this film would have worked better for me if they're if they followed up with Matthew Vaughn's original plan of having another film in between First Class and Days of Future's Past because it goes from First Class where it kind of sets up the X-Men and the school and Charles is crippled and all of that and the Brotherhood. And then, you know, they jump obviously 10 years later into the 70s, different time period. And it's just like, well, the X-Men or the school at least is no more it's just Beast who can turn back into Hank McCoy whenever he wants. Professor Xavier who can walk now, which I don't really buy the fact that he can just magically fix his spine. I know it's a science fiction film and like it shouldn't matter, but like that's not how biology works. Oh, do you, I don't know. When, yeah, no, when I agree with you, you on that. When one. you can buy someone sending someone self conscious in time into their body I don't understand how you, that's what you don't buy. Because it's not, okay, it's not like, it's not his mind saying, like, you can't walk, just walk, you know? It's not, there's nothing, there's nothing mentally using hindering him from trying to walk. Using a character who just goes through walls can send someone self-conscious back in time X amount of <laughs> years. Maybe if they maybe if they f- explored more on that instead of just writing it off like they did, <laughs> I just I just always felt that was kind of just like haphazardly written to as an explanation. I I never bought it. I'm sorry, Robbie. <laughs> um, I don't know what what else is in there that I. I think that's kind of it. I think besides just like some wonky parts in the screenplay and just it kind of being what? the weakest film visually from Brian Singer's X Men films, I think it's still fairly solid. I think Future Class is still the best, just because the writing in that first is class. Oh, what's that <laughs> first first class, not Future Class. <laughs> first class. I think I think First Class is still my favorite X Men film because the writing in that is handled a little bit better. Um, but otherwise, I think this is still a really good X Men film, if not a a bit flawed, in my personal opinion. And your issue um, having like for me, I think the script is one of the best parts of this film because. Somehow, I think Simon Kimberg managed to make it both a character-driven film and a plot-driven movie. Like, it absolutely is plot-driven. Like, Wolverine goes back in time, he has to convince Charles and do all of his other wacky shit, but there was so much real and raw human emotion in all of these characters. And I know a lot of people, when the movie was announced, oh, Hugh Jackman's coming back as Wolverine, everyone's kind of like, why the fuck do we keep resorting back to him? But in, I love how this is way more of an ensemble piece versus the previous three films, which is very Hugh Jackman, Wolverine is the lead. And in this one, I love how you really get to see the character development he's had over the course of all of these movies, because he has to be the Charles figure, really tapping into the emotions of all of the characters and bringing them all together. And he admits that he's not the best at it, and he's kind of having to figure it out on the spot. And I loved seeing that character development within Logan. It's just a great... For me, it's a great continuation of both the original trilogy and the new ones. And I know... I can understand why you have an issue with there not being a second film before Days of Future Past. It doesn't bother me as much because the way First Class ends 
and where this one begins, I can definitely see how these characters would have landed where they were. And I just think the movie just has a great sense of fun and how. Like, for example, one of my biggest issues with the MCU movies is they don't know where to put comedy. And it was so refreshing to watch a comic book movie where, in this one in particular, the comedy never upsets the drama. The comedy is spaced <laughs> out incredibly well, and all it all feels natural. Like, after the incredible Quicksilver... No, it was, like, right before the Quicksilver scene. Um, uh, Ch- I know Ch- Charles is talking to Logan, he says... No, I don't. No, I don't do violence. He sees McNeil. His instant reaction is just to punch the shit out of him. And or right before that, in the elevator, when he goes, so you, they say you can bend metal. Yes. My mom knew a guy who could do that. Like again, <laughs> the, the comedy all feels within the characters themselves instead of just coming off one character, a, a, aka Tony Stark. And <clears throat> and watching this, it just felt so. It felt so relieving and just so. It felt like a breath of fresh air to see a comic book movie able to balance tone incredibly well i um i, I want to kinda... build off what you said there about how people were just like oh god they're just gonna like use uh wolverine again as like the crutch as like the thing to take over like he's the main character kind of thing um like yeah for the most part of like this movie he is like the main character mm-hmm. he's the driving force but it is very much an ensemble film and that's what I love about the very last, um, the very end fight uh, yes. at the White House, mm. where they just disregard him. They wrap him up in some mm-hmm. uh, rebar and they toss him into the water, and then they oh let my God, I love and they that. let you see that these new characters can hold it for their own, and that they can hold their own franchise, and that we don't need Wolverine. Like Wolverine was still yes a very important character, but these also these characters can support themselves, and we can be entertained by them and they can make their own movies i also love i really oh, sorry, go on. i really i really like that about this film um how i know a lot of people a lot of comic book purists and who, who gives a shit um were very upset when they were when they announced that kitty wasn't gonna be going back in time because they were gonna use logan and then everybody was just like eh, but it's not kitty pride oh. <laughs> but here it, like, makes sense for Wolverine to go back, because, A, with the way that they established the time travel, he kind of needs to go back, because um, Kitty was long, long born by then. Um, and they still have her play an important part of learning how to send people's consciousness back, which is never explained. Um, but whatever. Um, but yeah, it's very in- it's very relieving to see, like, Kind of what Robbie said, you know, Wolverine in this film is a very is a much different character than Wolverine in the first X Men film, or the first two X Men films, or the first three X Men films. He's very much like he, he when he come when he goes back in the past, and he's able to sort of be the the figure to help Xavier in the same way Xavier was the figure to help Logan. He in becomes the, the, in the Xavier present. to Xavier. Exactly. Um, and I felt that was really, really nice character development on his part. And I do think it's really nice that when watching it, I noticed the same thing where Wolverine isn't the central figure. Yeah, he, he kind of, he's an important part of this, but really it all kind of boils down to the three pillars of the past X-Men characters, which is Xavier, Magneto, and Mystique. And Wolverine is just kind of there. Well, and I guess Beast too. You probably, I could probably count Beast as well. Um, and Logan is just there to kind of, you know, help move the plot along. Um, and like when they literally yeeted him out in the final fight scene, um, that was really cool too. And even the way that they set up like this new version of how he gets taken in by um, Weapon X, that was pretty unique too because literally his mind has been like at that point there's a reason why his mind has been wiped out because yeah. literally anything before that it's like the fuck just happened you know so i felt that was very unique and it made a lot of sense to me yeah um something i also love about the final confrontation in this movie is that 
I think Days of Future Past does a really good job of, I'm going to say this quote in Ryan Johnson, subverting expectations. But it's done <laughs> in such a distinct way, like, you expect the final fight to be this big, gigantic, you know, spectacle. And the thing that stops the entire conflict is su- is Charles giving Mystique such a heartfelt, like, speech. And it doesn't feel forced, and it feels completely in line with the characters. And I just, I love how the conflict in this movie is resolved. It, again, like, the... the the movie does a really great job. You think you know where it's going, but they throw an intervention that just barely manages to slide it off the course, so you're constantly guessing at what's going to happen next. At least that's what it was for me, anyway. Mm. Yeah. It's it's stark contrast between the future conflict, because that one's more that one's more based on spectacle when they're trying to fend off of the really, really cool Sentinels. Um, mm-hmm. I, I love the way that the... I love the future Sentinels that they set up, how they're based around Mystique's, uh, Mystique's power set yeah. of, of mimicking other mutant powers. Um, they I thought- also, like, genuinely felt, like, threatening. Like, in the, that, the way this movie starts off with showing how the Sentinels are, like, just murderous machines and they're gonna stop at nothing to keep going and try and kill the mutants like that you genuinely are like oh jesus these like little like minion things are actually terrible when characters die they die brutally yeah yeah like for fuck's sake colossus gets ripped in half i was just about to say bobby's head gets um flamed off and step on it's like holy shit yeah it's like, whenever... like Blink gets stabbed, like, twice. <laughs> even Wolverine, when Magneto's was putting the, the, um, the metal through his body, like, that was just painful to look at. Oh, yeah, that was so gruesome. Yeah. Like, like yeah. man, I kind of forget how... I think one of the reasons I like this franchise a lot is because the MCU is definitely more family-oriented, while this one definitely takes its risk with its violence and even course of language because they had that brilliant callback with James McAvoy telling Logan, I, I met you one time, you told me to fuck off, which I'm like, no, no, no. Except that you told was me the to wrong fuck quote. Yourself. Yeah. <laughs> which I think is the point because literally he remembers but also just doesn't remember the quote at all. He probably would have if he had his mind powers, yeah. but I thought that was really, really brilliant. Um, that makes me now wonder if it was just a writing miscue or if they did that for his character. I think they, I think they did that for his character. It's just me being the nitpicky little bitch I am. I'm like, no, no, no. He said, "Go fuck yourself." Yeah. Now I feel like I have to look this up. <laughs> you guys keep talking. I'm gonna find it out. <laughs> I agree with Robbie in that, like the X Men films, are and I personally think should always be a little bit darker in tone than any of the other characters in the MCU just because I think the X-Men hold a very important part in the Marvel cinema or the Marvel universe I should say where they're more about um, diversity and about the struggles of minorities which is always always a very important topic um to sort of discuss and hold 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 with importance the really Um, great thing about trask in this movie too is like yeah he doesn't have a lot to do and he's not like he's given a big you know character arc and big backstory but peter dinklage a is really good in this movie but b trask is just a his character is just a theme for what the entire films have been about which is discrimination and them simply not understanding and i just i yeah. love that these films explore that x2 kind of has a little preachy scene with can you try not being a mutant but its intentions is always where it should be always yeah and even though i think brian singer is a big piece of shit human being that deserves absolutely no credit um i will give him the benefit of the doubt that his 
his idea to focus on those themes heavily with the first two X-Men films and this film that he directed, um, I think is the best thing about these X-Men films to me and the way, and that's how they kind of get elevated above like typical comic book films because these, these have like a very important real life theme that anybody can watch and relate to. And I pray that now that the X-Men franchise is back in Marvel Cin- or Marvel Studios' hands, that they continued those themes. Um, otherwise, it'd just be kind of dumb, in my opinion, to have to uh, just make them another Avengers or another Guardians. I think that'd be very wrong to do the, um, in this particular situation. The most disappointing part about Disney now owning X-Men is that we're not going to see James McAvoy and Mac, uh, Michael Fassbender in these roles again. And they are so fucking compelling, not only separate, but also together. This, to me, is what Anakin and Obi-Wan should have been in the prequels. Yeah. And I know yeah. a lot of people, like Ma- Magneto, as well written as he is, kind of falls into the, the cliche of, I'm on your side. But now I'm on my side. I'm going to betray you. Ooh, mustache twirling villain time. But I feel like it works in Days of Future Past because, again, you understand the motivation. And within this timeline, you just buy It's not like X-Men Apocalypse where it's like, yeah, I've seen this before. Even, like, Dark Finn is like, yeah, I've seen this before. It still feels refreshing enough while being familiar at the same time. Mm-hmm. I, I completely agree. No, that the casting in this was 100% amazing. And it's just kind of yeah. unfortunate that it keeps getting boggled down by studio executives that don't know what the fuck they're doing and mm-hmm. really shitty screenwriting. Yeah, yeah. See, so yeah, another thing I really do like about uh, Days of Future Past that Cameron mentioned earlier, I actually really love the editing in this movie because... Everything feels so in the moment, and everything moves so quick, but it's not like we're moving, 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 like, let's say, Rise of Skywalk, which where it's just a plot moving because the plot requires it to move without a breather. And this movie is able to be fun and exciting while nothing much is happening, and then when you get to the big set pieces, it's still fun and exciting. Like, there is not a single moment this movie wastes. Every single scene builds upon the last in a very coherent way. I wholly disagree with at least most of the editing. Um, I think I think my dislike comes in tandem with the way Brian Singer shot a lot of this film. And it's weird to me that he's working with the two same individuals who helped him on X2 and one of them on X1. Um, Newton Thomas Single as the cinematographer, or Siegel, I should say, and John Ottman as the editor. Because I think, for the most part, he's worked with these two since the beginning of his career and basically has only worked with them since everything up to Bohemian Rhapsody because there's no way those two are going to ever fucking work with him again. Um, I think... The way I think this is more of a Brian Singer thing than either of the two, kind of knowing the history of Brian Singer's uh, behind the scenes working and um, a lot of interviews that I've read from John Ottman, especially when Bohemian Rhapsody came out and how he was explaining how a lot of times Brian Singer would not even be involved in the fucking editing room when when John Ottman was working on these films. Um, I think. I think this is a lot of the weird cuts that I had personal issues with and the weird shot ideas that I think some of them are just a little bit like too too wide of a lens choice for my liking. Um, but I think a lot of that just kind of comes down to Brian Singer rather than either of those two. Um, and when they kind of just like look wonky in tandem... They just kind of come up with a very weird, weird edit and weird looking scene. So I think most of my complaints visually about this film comes from just Brian Singer's somewhat absent direction. 
And I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you the movie has great cinematography, because I never saw the cinematography in the movie as bad. I just found it very serviceable. It's just nothing special. Yeah, yeah, but like, if you... And I, and I watched... I compared it with... Because I was curious. Because I, I, I was watching it, and I was like, kind of looking at this film. And I was like... I don't remember the last. I don't remember the last two films that Brian Singer directed in this looking this. Not, well, like, composed and edited. So I looked. I looked back on a couple of clips from the first X Men and X Two films, and I'm like, wow, this these this feels like, a completely different creative team, like no joke. I feel I feel that, there's just. You, I never would have suspected that it would it, this that Days of Future Past would have came from. These three, at all, like I think I think visually, and stylistically, the first two those those first two X Men films are so much more unique, and better handled than this film, and I don't know why I, feel that way. I just kind of do. There's just like something that's like a little bit off for me when watching this film. And then I and then I got even more curious because I have not yet seen Apocalypse. Um it's so I bad. just I just don't care for it and I haven't seen Dark Phoenix yet. Um I was watching also clips from so Apocalypse bad. which again sort of like is is also just kind of stylistically like Blech. Not necessarily all over the place, but like just kind of questioning the creative decisions that Brian Singer made with those clips. And then when I watched Dark Phoenix, I was watching that, and the cinematography just was a hundred times more impressive than w- the past two films. Um, which is funny because it was Simon Kimberg's first film as a director. Um, so I'd have, I have no idea if that was more of the DP Mario Fierre, I think it's his last name, the dude who did Avatar, um, if that was more of him kind of leading the visual look of that film, or if that was like Simon Kibberg generally like knowing how to compose and how to sequence, uh, you know, good shots. But I felt that looked way stronger than either of those, either Days of Futures Past or Apocalypse so I, I don't know. I don't know. That's kind of just me rambling about, you know, my my DP mind kind of just coming in being like, uh. Yeah, it do- doesn't look great. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it looks fantastic. No. It, to me, it's just like, it just looks normal. Yeah. If that's it's like, pretty like, standard. It just, it just, yeah, it's just, they didn't really try to do anything to blow you away, but it's also not like, it's just shit. It's just, you know normal yeah (laughs) yeah but it's like if you're doing like i don't know i feel like you could do a lot of really cool things like especially in the like even matthew vaughn did really cool like stylistic things in first class like that film looks freaking fantastic yeah Um, and it's a shame that it's like one of the few matthew vaughn films that's like really like takes itself very seriously um, cause the rest of the films are him like kick ass or like the Kingsman films. Um, and he, uh, shit, I lost my train of thought, oh, no. but even, <laughs> even in those, like, like, <laughs> but I feel like, you know, it being in the seventies, you could do like a lot of really dope, like, and I'm, I'm sure they probably did, but like, I almost kind of wanted it to feel more like a 70s film whether that means like shooting in the present day stuff on a um rather than using a digital camera using like a older you know film camera and then using the the you know obviously they needed the quick several stuff to be digital but like you can easily just add a fucking i mean the movie does match the footage fourth one mystique Bust out the window, going back and forth between the. Um, I'm really bad with uh, the, the the type of camera the guy was holding, going from a like a newsreel type aspect where the screen is just super small, then going back to the wide. 
Yeah, I feel like I kind of wish that he embraced more of the, of kind of that door. Because, like, in the 70s, it was, like, the style of those films were a lot grittier. And I kind of wish, I mean, totally, I don't, it, like, the way that the, at least the past stuff is, is presented doesn't fit. But I feel like they could have gone a little bit more grittier with with its with its camera movement, you know, just to kind of let us know that this is this is the seventies. This is this is the style. It's very like back in the day. You know, America was fucking furious. You know, and for me, I think the cinematography would bother me more, but. As I was watching it, I just got to the point where I just stopped paying attention to the technical aspects, and I was just engrossed in what was happening. I was so invested yeah, with the characters. you just kind of fall into the story. Yeah, I very much fell into the story and what was happening, and I was I wanted to see what they're gonna do more. Like again, talking like some great character moments. Um, I love it when young Charles meets older Charles. Like that that moment's just yeah. chilling. It's so powerful. That sequence was amazing. And then you get to the moment where we mentioned before all the older X-Men are, like, dying. Maybe part of it is nostalgia, but I found my genuinely, like, not tearing up, but being like, oh, fuck, they're all dying right now. And then, like, the confrontation with Magneto and Charles in the plane I thought was really well done. It, it definitely yeah. could have used maybe oh, a couple more awesome. beats than, the, the, than they used. But mm-hmm. I also understand it doesn't bother me as much because it's the first time they've seen each other in like ten plus years, and so the immediate reaction would be just these angry outbursts. So yeah, for me that worked. But this movie it just has so many great character moments that in the typical big budget spectacle film would just be completely ignored would be compromised in some sort of way and the movie always puts its characters before its spectacle and when it does decide to do these action scenes the action scenes are just so well done yeah honest like another character thing that i love from this is when it's in that final battle when you see magneto um he's fighting you know against all the other x-men to um pretty much keep what it was going to happen on track um and then it also then flashes you back to the present day with the old cast and you see magneto fighting with the Mm x-men and it's just like it's just done so perfectly where it just it's cutting back and forth and it's showing you how how eric has changed and how like later him realizes what the consequences of his past actions have been and then we go back to 1970 what for 1974 when this takes place 73 Mm -hmm. um and you see him just being completely moved by his emotions and he's not really thinking it through completely I, i i like it a lot also i found no thing saying that they um intentionally had the uh misquote Everything I'm seeing is just that it was just a straight up misquote. For the fuck off. Well, this movie's a one out of ten then. <laughs> <laughs> also, I loved, oh. I loved it when they intersplice um, Magneto's speech in the past mm-hmm. to the events in the future. Oh, yeah, it's, yes. it's a very, it's a huge juxtaposition of Eric going like, "This is what I want for my people." And then the future shows, like, that's what it eventually leads to. Um, yeah. And that's what I mean when it's like, I really, like, yeah, that's, like good, that's just really good editing to me anyway. Like, yeah. It's just. Oh, yeah, that sequence was, yeah. like, that was really well done. Also, something I don't really see a lot of people talk about is the music in this movie. Xavier's so theme, oh, which yeah. sounds a lot like Time from Hans Zimmer. Maybe that was an yes. inspiration. But that piece of music in this film is fucking gorgeous. One of my favorite moments with the score is when it's in the very beginning when um, they are all showing up to the temple right before they go, uh, the Sentinels show up and whatnot. And they're like getting off the ship and you see Xavier get off and you see Wolverine get off and like it's playing like whatever score it is for them. And then there's like a 
a nice like little beat there and then you feel like a menacing tone pick up and then it pans right over to um eric getting off the ship and it was like ooh, ooh, i like that <laughs> it's like that menacing tone but he's like on their side and it's just like how do you feel about this it's so good who did the score for this john ottman yeah oh, okay I see that now. Yes, Thank you. he is. He I, I, he's edited and 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 scored pretty much all of Singer's films. I just remember sitting in, in the movie theater when the opening credits started. There was the X two theme. You know, something we haven't really heard in such a long time. It's like, fuck me, my ass is ready for this experience. Let's go. <laughs> oh, man. So, do we have anything else we want to add, or what little final thoughts? Um, I don't have uh, anything else that I can think of right now. Let me let me look at what else I got, um, because there might be something that like I was gonna be like, but also. Yeah, I feel like I had one more thing, but I I don't know. I can't come up with it. But also. No, yeah, I think that's. Oh, oh. Uh, this is another technical thing. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to go. go. Nah, I'm not going to go into this. Here we fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> if I if I talk about all the technical stuff, then we're going to be here all day. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, but we all knew that. Um, um, no, I think I think that's all I have to talk about in terms of this film. All right. So, for my final mm-hmm. thoughts. I absolutely love this movie, and and uh, Cam, actually, I have a question for you. When you said this Shoot. is your favorite ex, were you counting Logan in that conversation? Fuck no, I'm I I forgot about Logan. Okay, okay it's my second. Okay, <laughs> hold on, it's my favorite. Logan's not an X Men. I'm gonna say, like ensemble X Men film. It's my favorite. Logan is is a character piece. It's not really an X Men film. Okay. It's a Wolverine film. I'll say it like that. Um, Even including Logan, this is my favorite X-Men movie, for for me anyway. It does everything I wanted in a big spectacle movie. It has exciting action, it has plenty of character moments, it manages to achieve all of those almost seamlessly in a movie that's over two hours but feels like it's like half an hour long. It moves beautifully. I absolutely love this movie, and I was going to give it an 8, but the more I talk about I'm going to give this movie like a light 9. For me, it does almost Damn. everything for me. If the movie had like the cinematography of Logan, this might be a 10 out of 10 for me, but at the moment, I'm going with a light 9. Um, yeah, uh, like I stated before, I mean it's just there's so much right about this movie and like hardly anything wrong about it it's just so well done um it's just captivating it just goes it's such it's got its own original takes it 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 spins some things in certain ways compared to like how comics does it how the comics do it and it's like it it works um and also, you know, Hugh Jackman just got insanely, insanely jacked for this the movie. The fact like, that he looks better in this than he did in the year 2000 is scary. It is insane. He like, just that keeps dude looking better just, and better. <laughs> I mean, you're basically punishing your body at the point with what he was doing, but, like, that is, it's just nuts, the commitment he had for this role for, I mean, this was, like... It, I don't know. I'd say this movie was like in the third. It was absolutely in the third act of his career as Wolverine. But mm-hmm. um, it's just like he committed to that role for twenty years. Like it's just it's insane. Or eighteen years or whatever. But like, and it just in each and every movie he gives it his all, and the acting overall in general is incredible. I mean, like I said, James McAvoy is honestly my favorite character in this movie just because yeah. of. He just the emotions he he portrays, and you could just see how much shit he's gone through in his life, and it's it's breathtaking. Um, and honestly, I think I would have to give this movie uh, not to be unoriginal, but yeah, probably nine out of ten. The only thing it was really lacking was great technical aspects, but 
I can get I can see past that when if the story is good enough, the characters are written well enough, if the acting is amazing, I can sacrifice a little bit of technical just awe for um, good story and acting. So yeah, nine out of ten. Um, I'm probably gonna give this like a very hard seven out of ten. Um, I still like despite my my shortcomings with this film in um a lot of the a lot of the the things that the film doesn't really do a good job explaining at um and just having a very weak visual style to it um it's still a really solid X-Men film and certainly one of the you know one of the the better ones in this in this franchise for sure um, I'd probably put it at like third or fourth on my favorite like list of X Men films. Actually, nah, I'm conflict. Well, I probably <laughs> would put it. I'm trying to think. Do I like this more than X Two? And I'm thinking maybe. Just a little bit. I think I like the fact that it's a better it's a better ensemble film than than X Two. And I think that's why I would put it above that because it's it's more focused on multiple characters rather than X two, which is kind of very is is very Wolverine story. Um, so I put that at three. First class is at two for me, and then Logan obviously is number one for me because that movie is a fucking amazing, so good piece of work and cinema in general. Um, yeah, I think that would be my ranking. Um, in terms of where it stands for me as one of my favorite as, of, of X-Men films and also um, the ranking that I would give it as a film. Um, I still think it's it's a solid watch. You know, things things that work in this film work really well. Things that don't work don't really hinder it too much. Um, but otherwise, I think it's, a, it's still a pretty solid X-Men film. All right. Well, that was another short and sweet episode, but I don't know. I feel like we got a lot out and talking about Side it. Side so. note: This averaged an eight point three oh. out of ten for us. Damn. All right. Nice. Um. So yeah. Um. Thought that was a good episode. Uh, next week, uh, we will be talking about Uncut Gems because that just came out onto Netflix. If you wanna be able to date how when these podcasts are recorded that's how you can please do it. watch um, gems. Oh my yeah goodness. we're we're all very excited for that episode i think we can probably make that a longer episode not that they have to be i just think that's gonna turn out to be a longer yeah, one because i feel like yeah, we can all talk that's, about that's that gonna movie. be a very high scored yeah <laughs> yeah um all right well thank you for listening and uh look forward to next week catch you later see you